Hey y'all, let's get into topic 2.1, cell structure, subcellular components. So all life is made of cells and we can categorize them into two groups. Are they compartmentalized and do they put their DNA in the nucleus or do they not? But all cells have ribosomes, which are used to make proteins, a plasma membrane, which controls what goes in and out, and cytosol, which is a jelly-like substance that fills in space. Plant and animal cells, which are eukaryotic, have a lot more though. We already talked about the nucleus, it contains the DNA. The rough and smooth ER produce proteins and lipids and then ship them where they need to go using vesicles. The Golgi makes sure those cellular products go to the right place. The mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell. Lysosomes and peroxisomes break stuff down and centrioles are useful for mitosis. Plant cells have all the other stuff I just mentioned, plus a few more exclusive things. Chloroplasts are the site of photosynthesis. All eukaryotes have vacuoles, but plant cells have a central vacuole, which is bigger than the rest of them. And plant cells have a cellulose-based cell wall. Hey everybody, let's get into topic 2.2, which is mostly about mitochondria and chloroplasts. A big theme in cells and biology in general is that everything is built to carry out one job. In other words, form meets function. And these two organelles are no exception to that. Like eukaryotic cells in general, mitochondria and chloroplasts are also compartmentalized, meaning that different things happen in different places and they're separated out by membranes. And interestingly enough, mitochondria and chloroplasts have two membranes. Mitochondria have an outer membrane that's smooth and then an inner membrane that's really folded up. And remember, the mitochondrion's job is to make ATP and making ATP requires different sets of reactions that happen in different places inside the mitochondrion. The Krebs cycle happens inside the inner membrane in what's called the matrix. And then oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transport chain happens along the inner membrane. A chloroplast job is to produce glucose using sunlight energy. The light reactions happen in the thylakoids and the Calvin cycle happens in the stroma. Let's get into topic 2.3 on cell size. Another basic rule of living things is that they need to exchange materials with their environment. They need to take in nutrients and get rid of waste. And cells, which are really teeny tiny, have to depend upon diffusion in order to do that. Diffusion is the natural motion of a substance from an area of high concentration to that of a low concentration. Basically, stuff spreads out. Some cells are better specialized for this than others. Cells with a larger surface area to volume ratio or more surface area per unit of volume are better equipped to exchange materials with their environment. And if you do the math, you'll see that the larger the cell, the smaller the surface area to volume ratio is. And that's why cells can't be that big. AP Biology asks you to be able to calculate the surface area to volume ratio of a cube and a sphere, and then know which one is better equipped to exchange materials with its environment. Specialized cells increase their surface area through microvilli, like for example, intestinal lining cells. AP Biology topic 2.4 is on plasma membranes. This lays the groundwork for like the next five topics, so strap in. You should probably know by now that plasma membranes control what goes in and out of the cell. This means all membranes are selectively permeable. They choose what comes in, what goes out, and what doesn't. And big surprise, the way the membrane is built allows it to be that way. The structure of the plasma membrane is described as being the fluid mosaic model, consisting of a phospholipid bilayer embedded with proteins, glycoproteins, and sterols. The key thing here though is the phospholipid bilayer. It's two layers of molecules called phospholipids. And lipids are nonpolar, right? Well, these ones are special because they're amphipathic. One side, or the head, is polar, while the other side, the tails, are nonpolar. So then the bilayer is arranged like this, where the nonpolar fatty acid tails face the middle and the polar regions face out. Membrane fluidity is influenced by the saturation of the fatty acid tails. 2.5 is on membrane permeability. Okay, so you remember how plasma membranes are selectively permeable? And the nonpolar regions of the phospholipid bilayer face the middle? And another word for nonpolar is hydrophobic? So what kind of molecules do you think can or can't pass through the phospholipid bilayer? Who gets let in the most? That would be small, nonpolar molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide. They can make it through that nonpolar fatty acid region of the phospholipid bilayer. And polar molecules really can't, unless you're really small, like a water molecule, in which case sometimes you can get through. But in general, large molecules, large polar molecules, and charged molecules cannot pass through the bilayer. But when cells need large polar molecules, like glucose, or charged molecules, like sodium ions or chlorine ions, that's what they have the proteins for, which we'll talk about more later. Last thing to know here is that the cell wall doesn't do what the plasma membrane does for plant cells. Its purpose is structure and rigidity. Let's start AP Biology Topic 2.6 on membrane transport. 
As I mentioned before, cells often have to rely upon diffusion to take in nutrients and remove waste. Diffusion moves things from a high concentration to a low concentration. It's kind of like going downhill. Diffusion happens when there's a concentration gradient, meaning that there's more of something on one side of the membrane than there is on the other side of the membrane. So if there's a lot of oxygen on the outside of the cell and not a lot on the inside of the cell, what's gonna happen? Well, the oxygen will spread out and more of the oxygen will go into the cell. Since that kind of happens automatically and without energy, we call it passive transport. It's not gonna work all the time though. What if we need to move something from a low concentration to a high concentration? Cells can do that with active transport, provided they have a little bit of ATP. It takes some work to go against the gradient, kind of like it takes some work to go uphill. If a cell needs to move big particles, it can use a vesicle. When a cell brings something in with a vesicle, we call it endocytosis. When a cell takes something out with a vesicle, we call it exocytosis. Topic 2.7 is on facilitated diffusion. We already talked about diffusion, so what's facilitated diffusion? Well, it's passive transport, but with proteins involved to make diffusion easier for things that can't go through the bilayer. Like ions require ion channels and water requires aquaporins. But back to the ions, ions are charged particles, right? So when you have a concentration gradient of ions, it also causes a difference in charge between the two sides of a membrane. That results in what's called a membrane potential or a voltage between the two sides of the membrane. Kind of like a battery, how there's a charge difference or a voltage between the positive and the negative side. In a cell, this is what we call an electrochemical gradient. And kind of like a battery, a cell can use this voltage to move stuff in and out. A cell's normal membrane potential or its resting potential is regulated by the sodium potassium pump, which uses ATP to pump out sodium ions and pump in potassium ions. Proton pumps do the same thing, just with hydrogen ions. Let's get into topic 2.8. So we know that water is important, right? And water diffuses as well, which means just like any other substance, it goes from where there's more of it to where there's less of it. The diffusion of water is called osmosis and it's super important for living things to regulate so they don't lose too much water or gain too much water. In a solution where there's more water, there's less solute or dissolved substances like sugar or salt. Where there's more solute, there's less water. So the concentration of solutes largely determines whether water will go in or out of a cell. Where there's more solute in a cell, water will flow in. When there's more solute on the outside of the cell, water will flow out. And when solute concentrations are equal, osmosis is balanced. Something to remember is that water follows the solutes and tonicity is super important for cells. Plant cells like hypotonic solutions so that they can remain turgid. Animal cells like isotonic solutions so they don't shrivel or burst. And nobody likes hypertonic solutions. Let's get into topic 2.9. 2.9 provides an overview of how cells move molecules in or out through their membranes. Passive transport is where molecules naturally move through diffusion from a high concentration to a low concentration. A cell does not have to use energy for passive transport, kind of like going downstream or going downhill. Active transport is when a cell uses energy in the form of ATP to move molecules against a concentration gradient from a low concentration to a high concentration. This is kind of like going upstream or going uphill. Facilitated diffusion is kind of like passive transport, except that it's used for molecules that cannot pass through the bilayer and it requires the use of channel proteins. Cells can also use charge differences or membrane potential to move things in or out. Electrogenic pumps can use ATP to move ions, which creates a gradient. Then that gradient can be used to bring in other molecules through co-transport. Finally, two more forms of active transport are endocytosis and exocytosis, which use vesicles from the endomembrane system and the plasma membrane to move large particles in or out. AP Biotopics 2.10 and 2.11 are about compartmentalization. What does that mean? It describes how eukaryotic cells have internal membranes that divide cellular processes and basically keep them separated out, and each set of membranes has a different job, aka organelles. Therefore, eukaryotic cells are compartmentalized, while prokaryotic cells are not. How did this come to be? The main explanation for this is endosymbiotic theory. So you know how clownfish and anemone live together and benefit one another? That's basically what we think happened between two prokaryotic cells a couple billion years ago. One large prokaryotic cell engulfed another one via endocytosis, and instead of digesting it, the large cell provided a stable environment, and the small cell made ATP using oxygen and glucose. Sound familiar? This tag team of cells eventually became the first eukaryotic cell, the smaller of which became the mitochondria. It's believed that the same thing happened with chloroplasts evolving from cyanobacteria. We think this happened because these organelles both have double membranes, their own DNA and ribosomes, and they divide independently. 